Welcome everyone to the session Discoverability in the Crisis at the FORCE 2021 conference. My name is Peter Kracher. I'm the founder and chairman of Open Knowledge Maps. And my name is Michaela Vignoli. I'm the community manager of Open Knowledge Maps. And together we will take you through today's session. Yeah, we're very happy to have you all. Please feel free to introduce yourselves as well using the chat functionality. And um, let's get started. First, I would like to say a few words about the conference. FORCE 2021 is the annual conference of the FORCE 11 community. And the goal of FORCE 11 is to make positive changes in scholarly communication. Anyone can join FORCE 11 and membership is free. And I would invite you to become a member as well at the FORCE 11 website. FORCE 2021 is a community effort. I would like to thank all the volunteers who made this event possible, the many community groups that partnered with FORCE 11 on this year's event, and of course, our sponsors and funders. All sessions are recorded and recordings will be made available after the event. For more information on the conference, please visit the sketch um, in the link that you can see here. And also please be aware of the code of conduct, which is available on the FORCE 11 website. Yeah, today's session is based on a paper that Maxi Schramm, Christopher Kittel and myself published earlier this year. And we got a lot of interest from different stakeholder groups on the topic. And this is why we proposed this session to the conference committee to have a discussion with the Force 11 community about the issues raised therein. We have an excellent uh, panel today, Nancy Kwangwa, Brigitte Matiak and Suzanne Dumouchel. Um, I'm very happy that you're all here today. Um, I will introduce you in more detail in a minute. But first, I would like to give an introduction to the discoverability crisis. Then each um, speaker, each panelist will give a general statement on the paper, which we've asked you to keep to two minutes. And afterwards, we'll have uh, hopefully ample time for a panel discussion with audience participation. Uh, you're free to post questions at any time, but please use the Q&A tool, uh, not the chat. Uh, so we'll use the Q&A tool for the uh, panel discussion and the chat can of course use, be, for, be used for side discussions or to post links to resources. Yeah, um, oh, sorry, no, I got the wrong key, um, but let's get started on the topic. Uh, I think that this image published in Science um, really sums up the situation that we've seen in the pandemic. So short, in a short time, a huge amount of knowledge was published. We're now up to 450,000 publications on COVID-19. And that, of course, makes it very difficult to get an overview of the topic, and once you have it, to then keep it. But it's not just coronavirus research. I think sometimes we all feel like this person here, we just swamped with the literature. Three million articles are published each year, conservatively estimated, and that brings about discoverability issues for any discipline and in any topic. And we can also see that reflected in the numbers. So we still have a high unsightedness of publications between 7 and 63%, depending on the discipline. This goes up to 85% when we look at data sets. And particularly bleak is the transfer to practice, where we can see that in this one study um, on in medicine, only a short, uh, only a small amount of research was transferred to clinical practice. And if so, with a considerable delay. And the situation is so bad that um, researchers around Jonathan Jeschke have coined the term dark knowledge. And uh, this refers to public scientific knowledge that cannot be discovered and cannot be reused. So we don't see the wood for the trees anymore. 
And um, what is even worse is that the researchers assume that there's more dark knowledge than there is discoverable, reusable knowledge, and that the share of dark knowledge is actually increasing. So we can sum up, there is a discoverability crisis and it negatively affects the quality, the efficiency, the impact and the visibility of science. If we cannot find relevant prior information, um, we will have research results that are based on incomplete and sometimes questionable uh, knowledge. The research will take longer and we might just miss the one particularly important paper for our study. And one of the reasons why we are in this situation is the tools that we have available. Um, the list-based search engines that we've used for so long, they're not able to deal with this explosion of knowledge anymore. Um, there is no way you can get an overview of COVID-19 with this screen, only 10 results per page, uh, very little context. And the only thing essentially what you can do is to go through the different results by hand. And at this time that we don't have in a pandemic, but certainly also in many other situations, discoverability is a process that falls short and leaves uh, behind blind spots. And it wouldn't be so bad if we could now go ahead and um, reuse, for example, the Google Scholar Index and build our own discoverability engine on top of this. But unfortunately, the situation is as follows. We have on the one hand institutions, researchers and publishers and um, Google crawls the knowledge. But on the other hand of that equation, we only have a war because we're not allowed to reuse that knowledge, to republish that knowledge. And so anything that cannot be found in Google Scholar becomes dark knowledge. And that's why we call this on the right hand side, the wall of dark knowledge. And unfortunately, this business model is used by most commercial vendors of discovery software. Of course, there are differences between the ones that you see on the screen, but reuse and republication are generally not allowed. Thankfully, we also have a different a counter model, the open discovery infrastructure, and here reuse is the most important motive. We again have institutions, researchers, and publishers, and they also contribute to libraries, archives, repositories, and aggregators. On the right-hand side, you see a small selections. There's tens of thousands of them around the world. And they have an open data interface. And that means they can be harvested by meta aggregators, such as open air, core, base, or Wikidata. And again, because they have an open data interface, they can be reused by value added services. We again provide services, components, tools to institutions, researchers, and publishers. And with this, um, we have a cycle of continuous innovation and finally also innovation in a space that has been stagnant for a long time where innovation was uh, far and few between. And it's of no surprise that also in the pandemic, the open infrastructure was one of the strongest uh, drivers and is one of the strongest drivers of innovation. A few examples um, here. This is LitCovid, a tool that builds on top of PubMed and provides a special entry point to the knowledge on PubMed uh, that is indexed there. You've probably heard of the Core 19 dataset from Semantics Cora, but they also have other specialized tools such as an adaptive research field and uh, visual discovery of the knowledge. OpenAir has also published the scientific gateway and the Sonodo community, which brings again a collaborative element to this process. And in uh, Open Knowledge Maps, we have uh, collaborated with Refigure to create a knowledge map of especially the uh, most reliable research on COVID-19. Yeah, so it's very good news that we have this open discovery infrastructure, but um, we haven't overcome the discoverability crisis yet. We're still in it. So the question is what is needed to overcome it. And from the point of view of the authors of this paper, um, we think that first uh, we need sustainability of open infrastructure. So um, we have seen that the funding options for nonprofit organizations and open source projects is severely limited. And in recent studies, 
um, it was found that the open infrastructure is not sustainably funded. Many systems could not survive uh, more than six months without continued grant funding. So we need to change the tide here um, because it limits the innovation potential and we need to start to divert uh, money to open infrastructure. And this is especially a call to research organizations to open up budget lines, funding lines for these tools. We also need a better alignment of tools with use cases. Um, we see a lot of uh, software being developed from a systems point of view, and this software then tends to fare uh, very badly when it is confronted with users. So we need a community-driven, a user-driven approach here. We also need to better support underserved communities. Historically, discovery tools have not been equitable. They have not been inclusive. And there is often a strong focus on English-speaking articles from Western journals. And as a result, many countries, languages, and disciplines have been neglected and are now suffering from a severe discoverability problem. And finally, um, there are a lot of AI approaches. We see also collaborative approaches, but rarely we see them combined. Um, and this is uh, a pity because we've seen this is very beneficial in other disciplines, not in other disciplines, but in other areas. And um, we're looking at the task of structuring the world's scientific knowledge. I think there are no two scholars who have exactly the same image in mind. And therefore, this cannot be done by a machine alone, but it can also not be done by humans alone. So I think we need a combined effort. So this is the um, paper in a, a nutshell. Uh, but now, of course, we want to hear um, the opinion from our panel. So please welcome with me again, Nancy Kwangwa, Brigitte Matiak, and Susanne Dumouchel. And I'm going to stop my uh, screen sharing here. And um, I would like to uh, bring up Nancy first. So Nancy Kwangwa is the manager for scholarly communication and publishing at the University of Zimbabwe Library. Nancy's role involves developing and implementing robust research support services. She's an experienced trainer in the areas of digital literacy, information literacy, research data management, and scholarly communication. And she also serves as an enthusiast for open knowledge maps. So Nancy, if I could ask you for your uh, statement. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, uh, for those kind uh, introductions. Uh, firstly, I would like to say, uh, um, to commend Peter, Mark Z, and Christopher for working on this paper on discoverability in a crisis. So indeed, um, from practice, uh, we are observing that there is a, uh, a crisis in terms of discovering literature, because we are um, having uh, researchers who are conducting different types of researches that require different types of papers. For instance, if somebody is conducting a systematic review, it means that they need to have access to a pool of papers and then filter down to specific papers to, to work on. But because of the, this um, uh, crisis that we're in, you'll find that they are limited in terms of the papers that they used in their research um, um, research activities. And um, uh, also I want to, to, uh, to echo that indeed there's a lot of uh, literature that's being published in different areas. And uh, the issue of that knowledge um, is also a reality. And um, also to acknowledge that in terms of um, uh, accessing literature in different um, uh, um, databases by different publishers is really an issue, especially in the global south, where we have to select certain databases that we subscribe to, meaning to say uh, literature that's in databases that we don't subscribe to, we cannot access, and our researchers don't have access to that. And then the sad thing around these whole metrics is that uh, our researchers, they publish in these um, uh, uh, global journals or with these publishers, but when they want to access their literature because we don't subscribe to these databases, they don't have access to it. And then open access uh, now, it's we have access to it, but most of our papers are not there because the researchers, they don't have like 
um, fund to, uh, to, to pay for some of the article processing uh, charges that are charged by some open access uh, publishers. Um, again, uh, on this crisis, when we look at um, uh, uh, the different services that are available in terms of discovery services, literature discovery services, you find that um, they are, when we look at uh, EBSCO discovery services, Primo and so on, they seem to exclude certain literature that's uh, in some uh, resources, in some spaces, which then um, eliminates um, some literature that is useful in research, in innovation and other activities. Um, and then when we look at um, specialized uh, discovery services that were designed um, uh, at a very fastest rate, I must say around COVID-19, it was really quick to come up with specialized uh, uh, discovery services for COVID-19 um, literature. Um, I, I would say we are surrounded by different uh, global, other global crises other than COVID-19. It would be nice to have uh, discovery, uh, specialized discovery services around um, uh, climate change, around other existing uh, uh, pandemics like HIV and AIDS, around other developmental issues that are pertinent in different parts of the of the world. And then um, also on open discovery, uh, having maybe another um, integrated open discovery uh, service that uh, combines different, um, different topics or different areas rather than having something that is more specialized. It's nice because uh, of course it's nice to have a specialized around COVID because it came up as um, an emergency but uh, going forward, having uh, an integrated open discovery service um, will, be, will be key. So for now, I'll end here. Some of the points, perhaps I'll, I'll share them in the Q&A uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very important points here, um, which I'm sure we will connect to um, going forward. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Brigitte. Dr. Brigitte Matiak is a senior scientist at GESIS, a Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences and former professor at the University of Cologne. Her research interests include research data management and in particular discovery of research data from a user perspective. Uh, she's a co-chair of the GoFware implementation network on data discovery. Uh, Brigitte, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the first thing that I would like to point out is that in our research, we find that a lot of uh, people don't actually see the problem because they literally can't see it. Because to them, there are so many papers that they can see that they don't really notice that there are many more missing. And this is, I think, one of the problems that that for a layperson or a person that is not so deep in, within all these infrastructure issues, um, it, it seems like almost like a non-issue. It seems like, okay, I can find everything because Google Scholar is just you know, whatever I type in, I get 100,000 hits. So what am I missing? They don't feel like they're missing anything. And I think that's also like a psychological problem why it's so hard to get funding because it, it seems like the problem isn't even there. And I think that that, that that's one of the reasons why it's, it's so hard to get sustainable funding out of that. And um, going back to the, the point that Peter made about the sustainability, I think that's very, very important because with sustainability, there also comes reliability for users. If you have a service and it's only there for a year or two, then as soon as you've discovered it, it's already down. It's 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 really frustrating for users. And um and 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 I mean, as a researcher, you, you spend a lot of time looking for literature, you're looking for data. But if you have to rediscover what the best service is for you every single year, or maybe you know every two years. That's very time consuming and people don't have the capacity to really do that. So, so having um, so, so really setting up an alternative to Google Scholar like PubMed or one of the big services really requires you to be in the business for 10 or maybe 20 years. And that is not realistic with the current uh, funding structure. And I think that's, that's also a big problem that this is not just um, um, a minor thing that you know it pops up and then it goes down again. It's also it just it 
it's never really allowed to reach the maturity that would need to, to attract millions of users that it could have. Um, and my, my third point is that, you know, I, I specialize in data and with data, all these problems are pronounced just like, you know, factor 10. It's, it's, it's much worse. Uh, we don't even have these sorts of centralized services. Um, even the commercial indexes are really bad. <laughs> so, so to trying to find data is so much more tricky than even um, the state that we have currently have with Google Register. And um, I think um, that there are a lot of uh, more challenges that go there. And I think that it would be an opportunity to build um, these sort of infrastructures for data right from the beginning. So you don't have that step through, you know, having these closed shop systems first and then transition them to open systems, but, you know, getting it right from the very beginning and they start with the open systems and, and then just never look back, learn from the mistakes that has been made in the literature. And I think that's my two minutes and my three points. So here you go. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's certainly a very good vision to have. Um, and we will definitely pick it up later on, I think. Uh, uh, now I'd like to bring up uh, Cézanne. Cézanne de Mouchel, PhD in French literature, is a research engineer at the CNRS. She works in the Humanum unit, an infrastructure for the digital humanities. Cézanne is strongly committed to the open science movement. She leads the European project Tripper, which aims to develop a platform for discovery in the SSH. She is a co-coordinator of the European Infrastructure Operas and a member of the EU's Board of Directors. Susan, uh, please give your statement. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Michela. Uh, it was uh, I really like the introduction that you made to this session. Uh, that's, uh, there are a lot of things that uh, I'd like to discuss, and I hope we will discuss uh, after uh, my uh, my few words. Um, so just a um, quick word to say that indeed uh, building a kind of discovery platform is not something easy. This is currently something that we try to do and we are doing uh, within the Triple project uh, to be the um, uh, platform named GoTriple. It's a discovery platform for SSH resource. I think it's a part of the way to, uh, to, um, to develop this kind of uh, open science uh, platform related to the discovery to be focused on uh, on discipline, especially uh, because uh, here I would like to to join what uh, Brigitte just said about the data, how to find data. Here I would precise the difficulties not really to find the data but more qualitative uh, data uh, because this is uh, I think the, one of the biggest issues that we meet uh, in GoTriple. However, um, what uh, is interesting in the, in the discovery platform there is also to address, to multiply the experience of discovering. And this is something I'd like to, uh, to highlight uh, here. Um, and this is, I guess, something that you show as well when you mentioned Google Scholar, uh, the fact that there is not only a way, a single way to, to make some discovery. We can uh, multiply the different tools it can be via sharing, via uh, communicating with each other, via the visualization, uh, via listing of, of, of results. So these are the kind of way, and I think providing a good discovery uh, platform in the open science umbrella is also uh, providing a diversity of tools uh, related to the discovery uh, experience. And I'd like to finish the, 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 this kind of statement uh, by opening it to something a bit different. Um, by linking actually the experience of discovery or the need uh, to, uh, to have a discovery experience with uh, the, the indicator and the impact uh, focus from our policymakers. Uh, I think there is here something quite uh, important if we want to maintain the discovery, uh, the discovery experience. Uh, if all the scientific uh, program and the research funding are made or uh, are sought through the impact uh, factor and through uh, the indicator uh, section, we will lose part of the serendipity necessary uh, to uh, the discovery. And uh, it will lose the, the way to, um, to make some innovation in research because everything is already targeted with clear objective defined uh, even, even uh, earlier, um, even uh, before the, the research has uh, started, and uh, that's an issue. And I think 
developing the kind of discovery platform that we have in mind, all of us today, uh, is a way to address this kind of, uh, of issue. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for um, the statement. Again, I think a lot of new angles um, to the topic. Um, I'm looking to Michaela to see if we already have any questions from the audience at this point. A moment, no question yet, Peter. Excellent, no problem. Um, so yes, for all the participants, please put your questions into the Q&A tour. Uh, but for now, uh, we will continue with um, questions from our side. Um, and you have already brought up a lot of aspects, a lot of facets of this whole topic. But um, how are your organizations, your communities affected by the discoverability crisis? So what do you see as the, the most pressing need from your organizations, uh, from your communities, from the people that you interact with? And this is a question to, to everyone. So um, if you if you want to say something, um, unmute yourself, raise your hand, um, we'll go from there. Yes, Susan, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I can start very, very quickly uh, because the, the main issue we, we I, let's say two main issues from for our community, so the social science and humanity community, uh, is first the quality of data. Uh, and quality of metadata as well, uh, actually. And the second one uh, is the multilingualism. So discovery uh, should also be addressed through multilingualism. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Nancy, Brigitte, do you have a particular view on this? Yeah, so what we're currently trying to figure out is uh, what the user's interests and needs are in the situation and also communicate to the wider uh, audience, especially with regards to data, um, because this is really something, um, well, you know, there's like this whole group of, of this whole discipline that, that tries to figure out how to how people use literature, but there are only very few people that, that do the same thing for data. And this is really a gap that we're trying to close now so that the uh, infrastructures and especially the future infrastructures can take these things into account from the very beginning. Uh, this, so this is one of the things that, that we're trying to uh, get into. But one of the things that actually happens is that it's actually really hard to find our research. So, um, because it is not part of this, this big canon. And, and so uh, I, I always go around give talks because a lot of people are just not aware of it. And so this is also like one of the things that, that, that unless you, you think you already know that there's research in that direction, people don't even bother to look or um, it doesn't really come up that easily in, in, uh, in, in the relevant uh, search engines. So yeah, this is something that we're really trying to uh, make people aware of and um, yeah and also well obviously we, we do have a literature uh, collection we do have uh, data collections and we're trying to make them as um, as transparent as we can um, so uh, we can um, so they can be reused by other people for example open air and so on thank you Nancy Yes, thank you so much. So from uh, our experience this side, um, issues around um, data, like what has been mentioned by Suzanne and, and Bridget, um, there are no like repositories uh, for, for data um, storage and also issues of data management is something that is really emerging that we are trying to work on in, to put in practice. And also, um, while well, we're still on that, um, issues of uh, capacity building, training around data use, data reuse and management um, so that our researchers, they understand that they can reuse. And then if they reuse, they, um, they cooperate in terms of uh, building uh, data repositories. And then um, the other challenge in terms of discovery um, is um, actually discovery, discovering our own literature. I mean, um, especially literature that has been published um, 
a very long time ago, which is not available in the uh, online databases. It's really um, difficult to discover such literature and also discovering literature that's still being published in, um, in print, uh, print journals, print books. It's very uh, difficult to really find out or discover literature that's uh, published in such, um, such platforms. And um, the other issue is on uh, having an integrated discovery discovery service. At some point, we, we tried uh, one discovery service, but um, it was ex excluding uh, so many papers from other databases. So it wasn't really uh, saving the purpose. So now the task that we have is when we train um, researchers um, or students, I work in a university, so we work with a lot of researchers and students, uh, you have to uh, focus on uh, each particular database. I mean, moving from database one, B, A, B, C, D going on. So sometimes you find that some databases will end up underutilized because one, maybe they are doing a study on human rights. They focus on a database that uh, uh, focuses on that particular subject. And then um, you find that they won't go to the next database. They just look at one one resource, which then becomes uh, very difficult to account for the value for, for investments that are being made in, in, in the various uh, databases. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think a common thread that I can see already is that all of you are working to um, make knowledge more visible that hasn't been indexed before, that is um, somewhere where it's um, hard to find at the moment. And um, one of the promises, of course, of open infrastructure is that it will bring in these uh, resources, these data sets, um, these languages that have been neglected, these geographic regions. Uh, my question is, where do you see the open infrastructure uh, with respect um, to these challenges at this point? Um, there are a lot of promises, but um, are there maybe also uh, problems here that we haven't um, talked about? Maybe I can start again, unless Nancy or Brigitte, you want, okay. Um, so where I see open infrastructure, I think uh, it's, um, this is the sustainable tool uh, that should make available and that should uh, de develop the discovery platform and the, the tool that should uh, support the discovery experience. So this is, uh, this is why we have all the open science umbrella. And this is where the principles of the open science infrastructure, or the open infrastructure, sorry, uh, are, uh, can, uh, can support the, the, the development of a discovery platform, especially in terms of uh, co-design, for instance, or in terms of user-centered approach, or in terms of the transparency of the algorithm. Uh, so these are, yeah, the first, uh, I don't want to, yeah, I want to let some, some room for Brigitte and Nancy, but that would be the first uh, very quick reaction on, uh, on your question, Peter. Thank you. Um, Brigitte and Nancy, would you like to, to add to that? Okay, um, so um, on the issue of the development of open discovery infrastructure, I think uh, this has to be uh, inclusive, looking at um, uh, several stakeholders. If it's going to be like um, a, a, a discovery service that is not like specialized in a particular discipline, it's important to have voices from across the the world so that um, all the voices are included. So from the paper, the, the, the article, uh, there was it was mentioned that um, uh, normally developers, they focus on the system, not the users. So if we uh, have um, the, the, the different stakeholders, the, the users, as well as the developers working together, coming in from different uh, regions, it helps to solve this problem of, um, um, uh, the exclusion of the under, underserved uh, communities or regions uh, that were mentioned in the paper around uh, language and other other issues. So having um, inclusion in the 
in the uh, in the development of the open discovery platforms is key. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that's actually very challenging because the the funding structure right now does not really um, cater to this sort of inclusion. I mean, you have the EU, but the EU usually does um, um, short term project funding, and in Germany we do have the uh, very nice situation that we have these long term fundings um, that run for 30, 40, 50 years, or that run indefinitely and just have to be evaluated every seven years. So um, that's a very nice starting point. But when I when I try to look, diff, you know, like what 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 kind of open infrastructures have been successful, um, it is often let's for example take Tsunoru, and I'm not you know, I don't really know how they're doing it financially, but it looks to me like there's this big institution and everybody comes around and, and, and tries to 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 participate. And um, I do think that usually these things are um, are open-minded in a way that the people who do it think that they have included everyone they know. <laughs> and But then, of course, they don't know everyone. So a lot of people are standing on, on the fringes there. And I think one of the ways that we can move forward there is to really make clearer like what, what people are missing by not uh, inviting that sort of uh, cooperation by, 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 by doing, I mean, it just the very situation in Germany, right? We're doing everything for Germans. So, and of course it's, it's, it's on the web. So everybody in theory could come and, and do stuff, but all the other stuff like, like uh, um, a training and so on, when in doubt, it's only for Germans. So, so that doesn't really make sense. And it's also not very inclusive. And it's also, I, I think that this, the threshold is, it's very high for people who's not German to go in there and say, okay, you could change that maybe just a little bit, but and then it would be much better for the whole community. Um, because they don't feel like they have a right to do that because it's all German, German, German. So so, so I, I think that it, it's very nice that the German government has taken it upon themselves to spend uh, hundreds of, uh, uh, I think about a hundred million euro on this stuff. But um, <clears throat> I also think that it's, um, it's very, very important to make clear also to the international community that it that that yes, there is a possibility if someone comes in and says, okay, we, we would like to have these sorts of changes, then we can do that. But I think like generally speaking, it's not the best structure and how to, to do that because uh, this, on, the, on the one hand, it, it's really it's really nice that Germany does this and I don't want to criticize my own country for that. Um, I mean, the alternative would be to spend no money, which obviously would be worse, but it's also um, it also builds a fence of some sort. And, and I, I think that, that these sorts of fences are maybe not addressed enough. And it's also not, not clear enough that, that, these force, uh, that these types of fences should not be there. And, um, and I think that, that that is something that, that occurs not just in Germany, but also in lots of other places. Uh, when these sorts of uh, um, money is spent and and then always someone comes in with, oh yeah, but we, we gave the money so we have the first right to do something. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, so nodding in the room as well, also experience um, that we had definitely um, at Open Knowledge Maps as well. Um, so yeah, I think um, these are all very relevant points. Um, Looking now to Michaela, I think we already have questions from the audience. So maybe you can um, kick us off with an audience question. Exactly. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so I will maybe start with the first one that had the most votes by Maria Levchenko. Even if we imagine a discovery tool that indexes all existing scientific knowledge, how can we address the issue of constructing the best possible search? Not many researchers, let alone general public members, receive appropriate training to use discovery services to their fullest. There are limitations to AI generated recommendations too. So how can we address this? Excellent. Um, who, who would like um, to go first? I think it's um, open to the whole panel. Brigitte, please. Um, yeah, so this is almost like a technical question. Um, and so since I, you know, I'm a computer scientist, I maybe can answer that. Is this an open research question really? Uh, but, but the thing that we have seen now is that there is a co-evolution of, of users, of literature searchers and of literature search engines. 
So um, the more you have these super convenient things like Google Scholar, the, the less it seems important to young scholars to learn proper literature literacy. Um, and in a way that's maybe a, a good thing, right? Because um, so they, they, they connect us more with, with their um, general um, information uh, needs and, and they can use the, this, this knowledge better. But on the other hand, it's um, this whole tradition of, you know, like when, when I was a student, we had this one seminar, which was just about how to find a research paper. And, and these things are, 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 are um, a lot of universities have gotten rid of these courses because they don't feel it's necessary anymore. And I say that very critically because there's still a lot of issues with it. Um, but I also have attended one of these courses recently, and I was like, uh, oh my God, this is not how people do it like, at all. So it's, it's very old fashioned what you're teaching here. So I, I think that um, uh, that sort of information literacy is really, um, there's so many changes right now. And, and I think this also has something to do with all the new infrastructures that are coming up that no one can probably keep track of because there's so many of them. Um, so um, that that in the end, it always comes down to someone doing like a general Google search and then see, oh, someone else has done this course and then I'm copying the slide and then I'm teaching that to the student. And so it's, it's often fairly old fashioned information that people are getting to, to, to the information literacy. And then of course people go like, yeah, okay, but why are we even offering that if that's just something that you could have Googled for like in 10 minutes? So, it, it, I think it's, it's a two-edged sword having this super convenient ways to search for literature um, because it gives people the idea that anyone can do it. Like even high school students, like my son, he, he had to search for literature um, without any training at all. <laughs> and um, and at, at the same time, uh, we are looking for for better tools and, and even more convenient tools. So so and, and and there is ongoing research and they are getting better every day. So so yeah. So we have to to figure out how to 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 navigate that. But it's a very fast moving field right now, and I I think it's it's very exciting what's going on there. So let's see what happens. Thank you, uh, Nancy Susan. Would you like to add to that, it's Nancy? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was a, a great and um, a great question. Um, we experienced that. We experienced that when we, at some point, we subscribed to a discovery service. You'd find that um, that the users of the system were saying, "No, this is really uh, difficult to work with. Would rather make use of Google Scholar." Um, so from my uh, understanding and observation from this system, um, I think it was more of a design issue where uh, emphasis was placed on um, AI and the system itself without maybe regarding the, the end user. And then um, when uh, the, 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 the suppliers of this uh, system were like uh, giving us an orientation of the system, they just looked at um, ABCD, but when one is actually uh, doing the study, um, it was really difficult to, 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 to get to the specific item from the discovery uh, system. So this was from a librarian's point of view. So I imagined how um, a first year student could, um, could uh, navigate around the, that system. So uh, in terms of the, the solutions, perhaps uh, it could be uh, providing uh, training on literature searching. So here we, we provide um, training on literature discovery where we do um, specific trainings on how to discover the eBooks, how to discover the print resources, how to discover the online journal articles and so on. So we provide training at different stages uh, of, the, of higher education. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thanks uh, for, for this insight. Um, Susanne, did you also want to answer? Yeah, very quickly, because everything, uh, mostly everything has been said. Just um, first, I can answer to, to Maria Levchenko to say that I think we don't want a discovery tool that index all the existing scientific knowledge. 
uh, we want several tools that can do that uh, in an interoperable way, but not an only one, because then uh, we arrive to uh, uniformization and we, we know that uh, it's not uh, something good for us. Um, for the second part of the question, I, um, I would mainly say that to me, the issue is more how to select the result. So once the researcher has a lot of uh, result about, yeah, to, to discover the, some, some data, how can we help him or her to, to select the result because, uh, and how the selection in itself, why this first one and the second one, and, uh, and we know that, so it's, it can be difficult to say, well, we can provide all the scientific knowledge in this platform, but then you don't know how, uh, which one is the, is the most relevant one for your own research. So this is maybe something to, to consider as well in the, in the building of this, uh, this kind of tool. Excellent, thank you. Uh, another uh, dimension to, to this question. Um, and I think we, we have uh, more, more audience uh, questions, Michela. Yes, we do. Uh, another question is by Dr. Julien Colomb. How different is the discoverability of data compared to papers? And how will discoverability of other research outputs like software, hardware, reagents, protocols, and so on, how will it gain from the work done on data discoverability tools? So I literally wrote a paper about that. <laughs> so it's like, what's the difference between data set research and uh, literature research and, uh, and, and uh, this research? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, but it's fairly old. So, so new things have been coming up since then. It's, it's um, fairly different. So one of the things that's different is that you lack the central Google Scholar infrastructures for uh, data. Uh, and generally speaking, when you ask people like how difficult is it, um, you would get like uh, for, um, for, for, for data discovery, you would get something like difficult or very difficult or, or something like that. And for, for literature, you would usually get something in the range of easy or very easy or something like that. So you would have, you know, like not blood overlap. So generally people say, yeah, it's more difficult. Um, to do that. And um, that's also reflected in what we, when we observe people doing um, data search. Um, and when you, when you observe them doing literature research, they, you know, they, you know, they, you, you observe them for 10 minutes, they have 20 papers. You observe them for 30 minutes, they have um, on average one half data set. So even that is, is, is like a huge difference. Um, and and the, the part of the reason is that um, that that um, um, well, there's lots of reasons. I've written a paper about it, but 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 one big thing is that it's not so easy to uh, figure out what is actually in the data and if you can use it. So, so this whole process of, of of identifying whether the data set is suitable for you. Um, so sort of that that's so much more difficult for data than it is for literature, and that is. Actually, something that I, I'm not really sure how we can change that. Uh, because if you ever want to cite a paper, I'm going to be like super honest here. I have cited paper just after reading the abstract because it was just like so super clear that it was relevant and that it did exactly say what I wanted it to say that I, I didn't, you know, in that context, didn't really need to read everything, you know, with, with all the fine print. Um, or I just, you know, partially read them before I cite them. Um, that is just not possible with data because data is so specific and you need to really look very, very closely as to what you're doing because otherwise you just, you know, you, you claim something that is not true at all because you haven't read the fine print of, of the data set that you're using. So um, there's, there's this really like general issue there that you just need more information on the data set. Um, but it's also uh, the issue that the search engines are you know, much more distributed, even finding the correct search engine for the data that you're looking for is so difficult and uh, always changing. Like there's, there's so many repositories out there. Um, and, 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 that, and then the metadata is just really hard to, to, to use to, to find really what you're looking for. And um, so that is really an issue. And uh, as for the discoverability of other research outputs, uh, software, hardware, reagents, protocols. So the one thing that I can tell you is that what a lot of people do in order to find data is they don't actually find data, they find literature that also cites the same data set that they're looking for. Um, because 
that basically, you know, like if you're mathematically thinker, you, you, you know that, you know, solving a, a difficult problem by solving an easy problem first. Um, and, and I think that you will see the same process also in a lot of research outputs like software and hardware where it's a proof of call. I do know that, that a lot of people um, do this too, to, for example, in, in astrophysics find um, the right um, uh, uh, satellite that they're looking for. Uh, because otherwise, I mean, it, it's really, really, really difficult just with three keywords and basically just Google or Bing or whatever to find anything. So, so doing this this kind of sneaky way around, just trying to find a paper that does the same thing that you want to do or a similar thing, is in many ways much easier than than trying to find the thing uh, with, with with just what you're doing. So that's a strategy that's very commonly used. Okay, that's from my part. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there were was a request in the chat to link to the paper because um, I think a lot of people are now interested in reading it. Um, but I'm also looking to Susan and Nancy. Do you have anything to add to that in, with respect to data discovery? Uh, well, thank you. Personally, I don't have much to say in this area. It's one area that we are still exploring and hope to learn more from Bridget if we could share the, the paper and we can engage outside this conference. Thank you. And I have nothing uh, answer to, to add to Brigitte say uh, almost everything. So thank you very much, Brigitte. And I've been interested to read your paper as well. <laughs> That's a huge success for your paper, Brigitte. Yeah, now, now the embarrassing thing is it's not open. It's not open. So <laughs> you can all read the abstract. I, I'll try to link a couple of things that are open. So this is Again, pretty old, so I just um, put it on a couple of doors there. Yeah, um, since we're on the topic of linking and connecting, um, we have a lot more questions than we can answer. Uh, but if you, uh, the panelists agree, please put um, your uh, email or uh, social profile in the chat where uh, people can reach you. Um, if they have a specific question, I've already seen um, in the chat that some people have already reached out to you uh, various, via various channels. But if you agree, please put a point of contact in the chat um, so that um, people can continue the discussion um, afterwards. Um, because we don't want to have this session run over. The next session is actually a community discussion on open metadata, something that I think is very relevant also to discoverability. Um, and um, therefore I would uh, go towards uh, wrapping up the session. And I have uh, one final question while you're putting your contact details into the chat. And so imagine um, there is a genie out there and uh, genie um, grants you a wish, right? But it's a very particular genie. It's a genie who wants to solve the discoverability crisis. So um, what would be your wish um, to this genie and uh, why would it be this uh, one particular thing? That's not easy, Peter. <laughs> it's not a gift <laughs> to finish the session, actually. <laughs> Well, um, since you're the first to answer, um, you, you have a bit more time. Uh, okay, so I, I have the genie. Uh, so what I wish for is uh, more sustainable money, really. Um, there are so many open questions and there has been, I mean, if I just look at how much money is being spent on, on literature and and how much also, I mean, there's also this whole library crisis. So generally speaking, libraries tend to get defunded rather than upfunded. And I, I think this is just wrong, right? So, so this is just <laughs> going in the wrong direction. And I think in very many ways, it, it has to do with that, um, uh, with that illusion that things are a lot better than they used to be. And in many ways they are, but also in many ways they aren't. And, and I think so my, 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 my genie wish is that people would realize that this is a problem and that they would act accordingly and that they would you know, steer the money where it does the most good. Yeah, so that's, that's my, my wish. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Uh, Cézanne, has a wish materialized? Yes, thank you, Peter. Uh, yeah, my, yeah, my wish would be to have a data provider better trained to have better uh, metadata uh, quality. <laughs> I think that would be, uh, I don't know how to do that. I think, um, let's say it's a long road to achieve that, but uh, uh, yeah, better trained data providers would be good. Excellent, Nancy. Right, uh, so my wish would be to have a um, discovery service that um, discovers um, potentially all the available information uh, resources, including data. And then this information when you're searching is clearly uh, classified to say, uh, from this set of results, these are maps, this is data, these are general articles, these are books, and then this discovery has to be inclusive, including, including um, literature from um, all parts of the world. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, what, what a great um, final statement. Um, I'm going now to share my screen again, so you also have uh, Michaela's and my uh, contact info in case you wanted to reach out to us. Um, we're coming now to the end of the session. A uh, huge thank you to the panelists. Uh, uh, applause, I think, is in order. Um, it's very great to have you to get all this insight, these def many different uh, details about this crisis, these different views. Uh, for me, this was a very rich, uh, very insightful discussion and definitely have a lot to think about uh, in the coming weeks uh, with all the input that you've given. I'd also like to thank the participants uh, for all of your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every question um, that you had, but we would definitely look to uh, continue this discussion in other areas and maybe even in, in Force 11. And um, yeah, I'd like also to thank Angela uh, for conceptualizing and co-hosting this session with me, uh, the Force 2021 uh, program committee, in particular, Iracha Puebla and Osman Ardiri, who directly supported this session. Um, please give a huge applause also to them. Yeah, and um, as I said, the next session at Force 11 is the community discussion on open metadata, a uh, very important uh, topic that has also huge implications for discovery. So I suggest um, and I invite you to join this uh, next session as well. Um, but with that, I wish you a good rest of the conference um, and yeah, have a great day. Thank you very much. <laughs>